Hey, United City, thank you so much for tuning in and joining with us today online as we prepare for our worship services. Hey, a couple of things. Today's going to be a little bit different. We're going to be talking about and taking the Lord's Supper together. And so I just want to tell you, even right now, if you have some bread and you have some juice, that you maybe go ahead and grab those, that they are readily available. So at that time in the service, when we have this time together, you can join with us online. Know that we're going to do it a little bit different. It's going to take a little bit longer. It's going to be a little bit more reflective today and so know that that's going to be an adjustment but it is definitely something that you can join with us and participate and we are very excited that you've chosen to do so i hope that you are ready today you're ready to worship you are ready to hear from god's word but do me a favor share this with somebody else invite someone send them a text maybe push that share button get the word out let other people join with you as we worship together and you can do that by just clicking there online wherever it is that you're watching this and invite inviting someone else to be a part of what God is doing. It's going to be a great morning. Let's get ready to worship. Let's 
opportunity today to baptize three middle school girls who've given their lives over to Jesus Christ and are wanting to celebrate that. We got an amazing crew that is here today that are watching them uh, celebrating this incredible occasion. Uh, this is Dakota Lacey. Dakota, absolutely. Dakota gave her life to Jesus Christ at Encounter Weekend just two weeks ago and now is wanting to follow through in Believer's Baptism and we could not be more excited about this moment and this time. Dakota, are you coming today to be baptized because you know you trusted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Based on your public profession of faith in the Lord Jesus and obedience to His command, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good job. Job. And this is Kira Lee. Kira, are you coming today to be baptized because you know you've trusted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Based on your public profession of faith in the Lord Jesus and obedience to His command, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good job, bro. Good job. And this is Sonny McDowell. Sonny, so proud of you. Sonny, are you coming today to be baptized because you know you've trusted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Based on your public profession of faith in the Lord Jesus and obedience to his command, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bear with Christ of baptism unto death. Grace to walk in newness of life. Good job. So, Lord, we worship you. Lord, thank you that we can come to you and approach your throne of grace, the promise of your grace and your mercy when we cry out to you, Lord, when we seek you. Lord, your word promises us that we find you, Lord. So we worship you this morning. We ascribe and give to you what you deserve, Lord. Amen. Come on, church. Let's continue to worship.
Are you thankful for Jesus this morning? Come on, let's sing it. heaven you know right now there's a party going on in heaven where people are rejoicing the father and we as a church get to come alongside of that and be a part of it this morning we've already seen God move we have seen people turn from darkness to light today I'm gonna say it one more time this morning we've already seen people turn from darkness yeah. to light watching them cross over from death to life and if this is your first time here, that's what we're all about. So church, if you're a member of this church or maybe you've been coming for a long time, I need your help welcoming every first time guest here and everyone who is watching on the camera right there. Come on, make them feel loved, make them feel welcome. We love you guys very much. Everyone watching online, we're so grateful that you would tune in to United City today. If this is your first time, uh, I would love for you to text the word guide to the number on the screen, 832-835-6979. I've had that number memorized for 12 months, and we would love to hear from you. That would be the best way that we could introduce ourselves as a church to you, as well as get you important information. For everyone else who's in the room today, uh, there is a card, a communication card in the seat back 
in front of you, and maybe this is your first time here. We know uh, that we have had several first-time guests check in to United City today. Uh, we would love to hear from you. You can fill out as much information on that card as you're comfortable with, and then drop it in the giving boxes as you leave. That can be your gift to us this morning. Everyone, I'm going to have you guys be seated just really quickly, but I don't want to move past this moment. It's really, really important that we, we take a moment and we look back. Because 12 months ago today, the world changed. I remember it so well because I preached on that Sunday and the room was not anything like this, all right? If you guys remember, every chair was facing that way. We were under construction and then a pandemic hit. And I got called up to preach that Sunday to the glory of God and I got really good preaching into a camera on that day because there were very few people in the room. And this week, it, it really just struck me as I was thinking back. And if I'm being honest, after that day, I didn't know if everything was going to be all right. I didn't know how, how is God going to use this to benefit the church? How is God going to have our back in the midst of this? If I'm being honest with you today, and I think I can connect with many people in the room, over the last 12 months, I have been uncertain about my own future. I've stressed about what are we going to do in the midst of all this? I've stressed about what is United City Church going to do in the midst of all this? God, how are you going to go before us in this? I have no idea. A lot of sleepless nights, a lot of stressful times. And church, here's what I got to tell you. We're here 12 months later. We are watching people give their lives to Jesus. We are watching people follow through in baptism. We are singing about the goodness of God. God has gone before us in our financial circumstances as a church. God has gone before us to grow our serve teams. God has gone before us to do what only God can do. In the midst of uncertainty, we serve a certain God. And when the Bible says that he will never let the gates of hell prevail against his church, guess what? It's true. We got 12 months to back it up. And United City Church is a church that is all about believing God for what he says to be true. And what he says to be true about your life and what he says to be true about my life is that the most worthy investment that we can make is to the church of Jesus Christ. That's an investment that will never go wrong. So maybe you've been giving for a long time. And maybe today you just need that encouragement to keep going, be steadfast. But maybe today you've never given before in your life. I, I was able to talk to someone this week who has never given a dime to any church at all until last Sunday. And let me just tell you, if I called that person up here right now, they would say, it's worth it. I'm going to do it again. Because it is, there is nothing like investing in the kingdom of God. So Jesus, we come before you right now, understanding that you are the God of all creation. God, that you truly are good. Even when there are seemingly bad circumstances that surround us, God, you are good. God, thank you for going before United City Church. Thank you for being our provider and being our protector. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that we would go further faster because of you and who we serve and not because of us and what we can strategize. Jesus, we worship you today. We magnify you in this place today. And I ask that you would do what only you can do. It's in the powerful, holy name of Jesus, I pray.
grab your Bibles, open them up with me to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. We are going to be hanging out in the middle of this chapter. It is so good to see all of you today. Just by a show of hands, I'm just kind of curious. How many of you plan to eat lunch today? Would you raise your hands? How many of you plan on getting lunch? Uh, I'm going to ask that you not be thinking about lunch the entire rest of the time that we are talking now that I've introduced this to you. But I want to introduce the concept in the idea of food. I want you just to think in your life, how much of your life is centered around food. Some of you may take different approaches when it comes to eating. For instance, some of you may be a a people who, for example, you kind of drive through fast food a lot just because you're just kind of always from one place to the next and you're just kind of always hustling and bustling and always on the go. So it only seems like that's the only thing you can do is just go buy uh, whatever it is that your fast food place is. Some of you are more like you love breakfast. Any breakfast is the best meal of the day, people out there? Anybody out there? Yes, for sure. Breakfast is the best meal of the day. Uh, No question 
question about it. And so some of you, uh, you may be like that. Some of you may be in a situation to where, honestly, you never feel like you have time for breakfast. And so you're more of like a maybe breakfast in the car, maybe not even that at all. Instead, you're just sort of uh, on the go all the time. Maybe you're somebody who likes to go out and have lunch appointments. Maybe you're somebody who instead just honestly sits at your desk and you just sort of eat lunch uh, from your desk and you don't have time to think about that. But every single one of us eat. Every single one of us have a meal. Every single one of us have to do this in order to survive. But what I want you to think about is not just eating, not just food. What I want you to think about is how many significant moments in your life, how many significant memories in your life all revolve around a meal. So for example, maybe for you, you've got like July 4th as like the holiday for your family. And so therefore, you know exactly what you're going to have. You know who you're going to have it with and you know where you're going to have it. It's a special memory. Maybe for some of you, it's Christmas and you've got a a particular Christmas Eve thing that you do or a Christmas morning tradition or something like that where you know it just reminds you of perhaps not only the, the coming year and the excitement of all of that, but also of years past. Because that particular dish or that particular meal just just takes you back to people that you remember eating that meal with. Maybe for some of you, it's Easter uh, morning or it's Easter afternoon or Easter evening coming up. And you're excited about how in one month, in just a few weeks, you're going to have the opportunity, hopefully, to come to one of our services at 8 or at 9.30 or 11. And then after that, you're going to be able to have a meal together. And it's going to be a very special, significant meal. Maybe you think back to a wedding reception where it was just such a momentous and such an incredible occasion for your family, but it also meant all of those invited guests got to share that great meal together. Maybe for some of you, it's an anniversary date, or perhaps it is a first date location. And so therefore, maybe it's not the nicest place in the world, but you kind of find yourself gravitating and going back to that why, because that particular place and that particular meal has special significance. What I want us to do this morning, as you can probably tell, we're going to take the Lord's Supper together. We're going to have a special meal together. This is a meal that is talked about in Mark chapter 14 that is introduced to us. In many ways, it's called the Last Supper when we read it, but it's something that is so special. It is so significant. We are actually told that we are to repeat what takes place this particular night with Jesus and his disciples going into the future and to reflect to ponder, to remember. So we're going to have a little meal together this morning. And as I invite you to this meal, what I want to ask that you do is I want to, uh, I want to ask, how are we supposed to celebrate the Lord's Supper? Whenever we come and we do this, which we're doing this morning, we're also going to do again on Good Friday. We'll do a number of other times the rest of this year. When we come to this table and we have this meal together, what are we supposed to do? For some of you, this may be a little bit different. First of all, you notice it's a little bit more formal already. This is not how we normally do this. In fact, this isn't even how we're normally going to do this in the future. We're just doing it a little bit different today, trying to change things up, because I know that whenever you change something up, it typically allows you to reflect and remember a little bit better. If I have to say so myself, I look pretty nice in a coat, just throwing a coat on today for a little bit different, trying to dress up just a little bit. You don't have to dress up whenever you come. However, I lost some weight, fits good. I just wanted to throw it on and just be able to celebrate the special occasion. This, This is a coat that I've worn whenever Hillary and I go out for some special anniversary meal or some special place. And I wanna just kind of show the occasion. Please hear me though, it's way too hot. I'm not about to start wearing coats in Texas, okay? Just please, please hear me on that. You don't have to aware of that as well. I just want us, though, to think about this meal differently today. Because for some of you, here's your story. You grew up maybe in in traditions or you grew up in the church where like you had this thing every single week. And honestly, you're kind of wondering why we don't do it more often than we do. Uh, For some of you, you may be in a situation to where maybe you're new here to the church. You're new to church altogether. Maybe you just came because somebody was getting baptized. You got invited. And honestly, this whole thing is a little bit weird to you. In just a moment, we're actually going to take these really formal looking things and we're going to pass them out and we're going to actually present it to you. You're going to take these two little cups and it's going to have some some juice in it and it's going to have a little stale piece of bread in it and you're going to be able to have these things and you're going to wonder like, what is this? And so for you, to be honest with you, you've heard of people that have done this. You've seen people do this at time, but you honestly have no idea. I would tell you it's a perfect day for you to be here. 
Because what I want to do is I want to teach you what we do and why it is that we do it. Some of you may have grown up in traditions like I did. Where I grew up in the church, we did not take the Lord's Supper that often. All I remember is that whenever we did do the Lord's Supper, it meant that you had to be quiet for a long extended period of time. And if you made a sound, your life was over, all right? It was done. And especially, you had to hold on with a death grip to that little cup and that little juice because if you spilt it, your parents were going to, I mean, it was bad. It was going to be bad news, not a good thing. And so for some of you, honestly, you've done this, but you honestly, this is just a time when you mentally check out and you don't really think about much about what it is that we're doing. What I'm hoping to do today is to both teach you And then what we're going to do is we're going to have a meal together. We're going to participate and take the Lord's Supper together as a church. Let's begin reading in Mark chapter 14 where it talks to us about this meal. Beginning in verse 12 of Mark chapter 14. It says that on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. There prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him one after another, Is it I? He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing, it broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When you come to the Lord's table, there's three things that I want to ask that you do. Not only this morning, but there's three things that I want to ask you do the next time that we take this on Good Friday. The next next time that we take this after that, I want to ask that you do it as well. There's three things. First thing I want you to do is this. When you come to the Lord's table, I want to ask that you look around. I want to ask that you look around. The setting for this particular meal is the Passover. We're going to talk about that more in just a moment. But basically what it meant is that they were preparing this meal, this very traditional meal that they had every single year to commemorate an event. And so Jesus sends his disciples out to go and to prepare this meal. They come and they find it just like he said that it was going to be. They set it all up and they begin to have this meal together. If you continue on in the story, which I hope you will in the coming weeks as we finish up the Gospel of Mark, you will discover that what immediately takes place after this meal is that all of these 12 disciples will end up abandoning Jesus at a time when he will need them the most. At a time whenever he needs them to stand up with him, to defend him, he will look up and none of them will be around. In fact, he even says here and predicts that one of them will actually betray him. And we see here in just a moment, if you continue in on the text, that basically he leaves from this place, from this meal, and goes to do it. We're going to see next week that you're going to see all of these people, including one of the guys there, who actually ends up promising that he will never leave Jesus, only to epically deny him three times. Now, if I'm Jesus and I have the ability of foreknowledge, which he does, And I know what these guys are about to do to me. I know how they're about to leave me. The last thing that I would want to do in that moment is share a meal with them. 
But Jesus instead comes along, and we know in a parallel passage, it actually says that he washes their feet. It was a customary thing for a servant to wipe off the feet whenever you entered into a house. And Jesus takes on that role, and he washes the feet, and he serves a meal with the very people who would end up denying and abandoning him. Folks, I want you to see this group of people represented all of us. You've got people in there like James and John. These are ordinary fishermen who had an ordinary job. These are kind of your common, everyday man who left everything to go and follow Jesus. In the crowd, you also have a man named Matthew who formerly was named Levi. He was a super wealthy, successful tax collector. He was somebody who was uber rich and uber successful. So if you're that today, you're included as well. Maybe some of you find yourself in here and you're a little bit skeptical. There was one of those guys too. His name was Thomas. In fact, we see after Jesus resurrects from the dead that he goes and he appears before the disciples and Thomas is like, "Ah, I don't know if I buy this. I'm not so sure. In fact, he got the nickname Doubting Thomas. If there's any leaders in the room, I want you to know you're included too. Peter was one of the leader among leaders. P- Peter was somebody who was always willing to speak up. He was always willing to, to say, I'll go do this for you, Jesus. I'll go do whatever you want me to do. Only we discover next week to epically fail by denying Jesus. What I want you to ultimately see at this is at the table of Jesus, at this meal then and at this meal today, there is a place for everyone. The Lord's Supper, this meal that we're about to take, is the ultimate level playing field. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it's talking about the Lord's Supper, and it's talking about the Corinthian church serving it to each other. Let me pick up the reading in verse 17 and look at what it says. It says, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church... I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat, for in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry and another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Ultimately, what he's saying here is this. He's saying, look, you shouldn't come to the Lord's table arrogantly or with division. What happened was is these people came and they thought they were more important than somebody else. And so they just started eating and not waiting on everybody else. And what he's ultimately trying to say is this. None of you get to come to this table any better off than anyone else. We all come as invited guests. Folks, what I want you to understand is this. Whether you are white, whether you are black, whether you are brown, whether you are rich, whether you are poor, whether you are average, whether you are artsy, whether you are musical, whether you are athletic, whether you live in Houston or in Huffman or in Crosby or in Spring, Atascacita, New Caney, Porter, Kingwood, Humble, no matter where it is that you live, if you're somebody that's a churchy person and you know how to do this and you know that you're supposed to kind of be reverent when you take the Lord's Supper, or if you're not a churchy person, and to be honest with you, you're not even sure what you think about all of this stuff, you're just kind of here to make somebody else that's with you happy, whatever your situation is, all of us come to this table the same way. None of us can look at somebody else and think, I'm more deserving to be here than you. Which means this, one, we should never come into this room and we should never come to this table arrogantly. We should never be puffed up with pride, somehow thinking that God is so lucky to have us on his team. On the other hand, we also should never come to this table with insecurity. We should never come to this table feeling like we are unworthy because, spoiler alert, we are all unworthy. None of us deserve to be here. None of us have done enough to be able to warrant being able to celebrate this meal together in our church and celebrate this meal together with our Lord. But here is the beauty of this, all of us in this room today. No matter what your background, no matter what your situation is, we are all invited guests Second thing I want you to do whenever you celebrate the Lord's Supper, besides just looking around, number two, what I want to ask you to do is I want you to ask you to look back. When you come to the Lord's Supper, when we take this meal here in just a moment, 
whenever we take this meal on Good Friday, when we take this meal in the future, that you would let it be a season where you look back and you remember. The setting, as I mentioned to you, was the Passover. The Passover was a time when literally millions of Jews would come onto the scene. They would come into the city of Jerusalem to celebrate this momentous occasion. What it was celebrating, if you go all the way back to the book of Exodus, it talks about how all of the Israelite people were in bondage and in slavery to the Egyptians. And how God miraculously delivered the Israelite people through a series of plagues. The very last plague that was given was one where God said that he would send his angel down to the earth. And he would go and he would see which houses uh, he would go and take, over, take out the firstborn in and which houses he would pass over. I want you to look with me and turn in your Bibles over to Exodus chapter 12 because I want you to see that this particular, uh, this particular, um, uh, this particular uh, plague was the, the plague that really ended all of the 10 plagues and ultimately led to Pharaoh who was in charge at the time to tell the Israelite people, all right, that's it, you guys go. Get out of here. Y'all go, leave slavery, and you can go and worship your people. Let's begin reading Exodus chapter 12. It's the very beginning, second book of the Bible. I'm going to begin reading in verse 3. It says, Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to, his father's, to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. So here's the instructions. What he says is, is that the people of Israel are to take a lamb into their home for four days. Uh, At the end of this four days, which they're to do this on the 10th day of the month, at the end of those four four days, the 14th day of the month, they are to slaughter this unblemished lamb, this perfect lamb. And then what they are to do is they are to put the blood from this lamb that is poured out and they are to paint it on the door frames of their house. So they they have this blood up on the doorframe. And then the story goes is that this angel would come and he would see every house. If a house did not have blood on the doorframe, then he would kill the firstborn in that house. If the house did have the blood on there, he would pass over that house. So in the process, what he did is he spared the Israelite people and he brought judgment on the Egyptian people. Now we hear that and we may think that's kind of cruel, but he was executing his righteous judgment on the people, but by doing so, he was freeing God's people from slavery and allowing them to go and freely worship. This was such a momentous occasion. We see in Exodus chapter 12, verse 14, it says, this day shall be for you a memorial day and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations as a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. This is what they were doing here in this moment. They were celebrating the Jewish Passover. The time when they remember how this lamb was was killed, his blood was poured out, and God passed over them and spared their lives. So now Jesus, on the very night when the Jewish people were gathered to have the Passover, he is saying that, hey, I want you to see that what we are about to do, I'm about to do with my life. So something that was told about 1,500 years prior is now being seen as a picture of what Jesus is going to do. Instead of this lamb being, having his blood poured out, and, and spilled out to represent the fact that the Israelites were being freed up from Egyptian slavery. Instead, Jesus was saying this, my body is going to be broken for you. 
My blood is going to be poured out for you. It's a new covenant. And what this is going to represent is the fact that now my blood is going to free you up from the bondage and the slavery that you have to sin. Folks, what I want you to see is that Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice for us. He was our Passover. John chapter 1, verse 29, it says, The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, listen to the language, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is a picture back to the Passover. Listen to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. It says, For Christ, our Passover Lamb, has been sacrificed. Jesus was giving his life, the Lamb of God, on our behalf. Listen to this in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. It says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus takes upon himself the sins of the world. So when we come to this table, what we are being invited to do is to look back and to remember, not to reflect on our sins, Some of you, your sin and the stain of your sin and the consequences of your sin is so great and so fresh and so real. To be honest with you, the last thing that you would want to do is look back on that. Perhaps for some of you, though, you you feel like your life has been one where you spent most of your life saved. You can't remember what life was like even before Christ. And I want you to all look back and remember not the depth of your sin. Instead, what I want you to all look back when we take this meal together and remember the sacrifice that was made on your behalf. If Jesus hadn't poured out his blood, then guess what you would still be doing every year? You'd be getting an animal, you'd be killing it, you'd be trying to offer up a sacrifice, or you would do what so many had done in that day, and they just got tired of it, and they just kind of forgot about it, and they just live in their sin trying to do the best that they can. Folks, when we take this, blood, when we take this cup, when we take this, this, this juice, when we take this bread, what it's doing is it's allowing us to remember something that too often we so easily forget. We just saw a testimony of it through believer's baptism. We just saw these three girls, they, 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 get, they were baptized and it represented the death, the burial, and then the resurrection of Jesus. That's why we put them underneath the water and we bring them back up. We believe that's exactly how the Bible teaches that baptism, this expression of the gospel should be. Please know whenever we take the Lord's Supper together, we are declaring the gospel as well by looking back and remembering what Jesus has done. What I want to ask that you do as well is not just look around you, realizing we all come in the same way, not just looking back, remembering what Jesus did, but in addition, when you come to the Lord's table today and in the future, I want to ask that you look ahead. I want to ask that you look ahead. Turn with me, if you would, to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. It is the last book of the Bible. Chapter 19 is the third to last chapter in the Bible. It's the very, very end. Uh, if you have a hard copy of God's Word. And I want to read for you about a pretty cool wedding. Not only a wedding, but a wedding ceremony and reception that is going to take place in the future. Revelation chapter 19, let's begin reading in verse 6. It says, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints." And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the word, the true words of God. The Bible teaches that one day Jesus, the Lamb, is going to come back for his bride, which is the church. John chapter 14 verse 3 says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. In establishing this new meal, Jesus is looking ahead, and what he's saying is this, is one day I'm going to return to the earth, and whenever I return, I, the Lamb of God, am going to come back for my bride, which is the church, which is us, 
And at that marriage ceremony that will take place, I want you to know that after that, there will be something called the marriage supper of the lamb. This is the greatest wedding reception of all time. I know I'm going to get in trouble saying this. I know that I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it, all right? Uh, I'm a pastor, and one of the roles that I have as a pastor is that I uh, get to officiate weddings. I've literally officiated hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of weddings over the years. I know I'm going to get in trouble for saying this. Every wedding is the same, all right? There you go. Spoiler alert. Every wedding's pretty much the same, Okay. All right, I mean, you, you pretty much, I pretty much can tell you what everybody's going to wear. I pretty much can tell you what the flow of service is going to be. I can pretty much tell you within a, one or two of what songs are going to be done. I can pretty much tell you what the vows are going to sound like, and I can tell you how the whole thing's going to end, and I can tell you how everybody's going to go out. I've done hundreds of these things. I can tell you pretty much all weddings are the same. But did you know, despite the fact that that is the case, the average cost of a wedding in the United States is $24,723. In the city of Houston, the average wedding goes up to $28,988. $28,988 for a wedding that pretty much all the same. What makes weddings different? What makes weddings memorable? Spoiler alert, the reception. That is where it's at, okay? I'm just telling you, all right? Uh, if you ladies are in here and you've got a boyfriend or you've got a husband or you've got a, a child and you think that somehow they like going to weddings with you, they don't. They are only sitting through it because they know uh, the reception is coming on the back end of this deal, all right? I know that there's going to be an opportunity. It is the case every single time. Even I, who do the weddings, I, I'm constantly thinking, I wonder if they're going to have a mashed potato bar. I wonder if they're going to have prime rib. I wonder if they're going to have a buffet. Like, I wonder what kind of appetizers they're going to have. I'm thinking about that the whole time. Why? Because it is an awesome time of being able to celebrate and eat constantly on somebody else's dime. It's the greatest thing ever. <laughs> somebody else pays for it. I mean, seriously, it's so great. And so I'm just telling you, spoiler alert, all right? So last wedding, a couple of weddings I've been to, sure enough, I go and I do the wedding and I'm doing the whole deal. And then at the end of that, I take the pictures and the family's still taking the pictures. And what am I doing? I'm going, I'm looking for the people walking around with the appetizers. Here's the deal. I don't even know what's on the tray, but it's guaranteed I'm going to get one. You want to know why? I'm not paying for it. So who cares? It's just whatever. Let's just get this and let's eat it and let's try it out. If I don't like it, I can just set it down and walk away. Go get another one that I do like. It's great. Okay. Uh, I usually almost always only drink water. But you know what I do whenever I go to a wedding? I order me a Coke every single time. You want to know why? Because I can and I'm not paying for it. All right. It's the greatest thing ever. Uh, you know what I do? I take a couple of sips of that. And you know what? I'll just try Dr. Pepper now. And so what I do is I go try Dr. Pepper. And again, it doesn't make any difference whatsoever. I feel no guilt at all. I just just enjoy myself. I then go and I kind of peruse and I browse and kind of see, what is this? Is this going to be a sit-down meal? Is this going to be a buffet? I personally like buffets the best, but you know what? You can fill up your plate. You can eat a couple of bites. You can go back and get whatever else you want. It doesn't make any difference because you know why? You're not paying for it. It's on the bride's family. It's the best gig ever, all right? And you're just enjoying it and doing that. Now, here's what I would also tell you. I'm pretty much all of you are in the same boat. You all stay all the way through that reception, not because you want to make sure that you love on this couple. You stay because they put the cake at the end, right? And you want to eat the cake. I don't even like chocolate, but I might that day. And so guess what I do? I get a piece of cake every single time, all right? I get a bride's cake, I get the groom's cake, and I want to make sure that I have a great time. And I'm telling you, this is exactly how all weddings go and all receptions go. And I'm not going to lie to you, I had this epiphany at the last wedding that I was at. It hit me. I've got two daughters <laughs> who are teenagers, who've grown up a lot faster than I would have wanted them to. We're going to be driving potentially in about a year or so. And then I know that that means that, that all of a sudden things are going to start progressing. There's a potential one day way down the road, they might start dating somebody. Uh, and then eventually they may bring that boy home and say, hey, I actually want to get married. And they're going to want a really nice wedding. Can I tell you what a really nice wedding means? It has nothing to do with the wedding. What they mean is they want a really nice reception. And it made me realize this. Some of you are going to be at that wedding reception. And some of you are going to be walking around looking for appetizers that I paid for. <laughs> some of you are going to be out there drinking drinks that you don't care anything about just because I paid for it. And you don't have to worry about it. 
you're going to go through the buffet line and you're going to leave plates half eaten, which would drive me nuts at my house, but I never thought about because I'm at a wedding. Who cares? And you're going to be doing that at my wedding, all right? And I'm just telling you right now, you better eat every single thing on your plates. <laughs> every one of you. Folks, I want you to understand something. What makes a wedding reception so great is not only the momentous occasion that is celebrated, but it's that somebody else paid for it. I want you to hear me. As we take the bread and as we take the cup, I hope that your heart begins to flutter and get full recognizing that as we break the bread, the symbolic breaking the, the, the bread, which means that Jesus broke his body for us, when we drink of the cup, which is the blood being poured out, which is the new covenant, the Bible tells us, that reminds us of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. It's followed by his resurrection. And what that means is, is that Jesus is alive. And he is seated in his throne room in heaven. And he one day is going to come back. And as we take of this meal, yes, we're looking around and we're realizing we're all here the same way. Yes, we're looking back and we're remembering the cross. But we also are looking forward to that unbelievable meal. And he paid for it. He paid for all of it. And so because of that, we can enjoy. And because of that, we can have hope. And because of that, that we know that even the greatest difficulties that may come upon us still have a sliver of joy, still have a sliver of hope. Why? Because we know how the story ends. So therefore, it is reflective, but it is hopeful. It is introspective, but it is also a time I'm going to ask at this time our, our deacons would come forward as we prepare to receive the Lord's Supper together. Here's how we're going to do this. If you're watching me online, I encourage you to go ahead and get your elements, wherever it is that you have them at your home, and just prepare to receive these with us in just a second. For those of you that are here, our men are going to be in a safe way. Uh, they're going to get these trays, and they're going to come, and they're going to put them in front of you. Uh, I want to let you know that there are two cups inside of the trays. Uh, one has the bread and one has the juice. They're stacked on top of each other, so please be sure to grab both of those. What I want to ask you to do is I want to ask you to hold on to those, uh, and then at the appropriate time, I will lead us all together to take these, uh, these elements together. But I want to, I'm just going to be a little bit longer than normal. I don't want you to feel tense and, and uptight because you've got to be quiet and make sure you don't drop it. That's not the point. But I do want you to reflect. I want you to look around. And just thank God that you get to be here. I want to ask that you look back and I want you to think about the sacrifice done for you. Man, I hope that your, 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 your body, your, your, your face begins to smile as you begin to re realize just what it is that we have to look forward to.
same night, he took the cup, which was filled with the fruit of the vine. And he said, this is the blood of my new covenant. As often as you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me. I'm going to ask Dave Kinney, our executive pastor, to pray for us. Jesus, we come before you right now with honor in our hearts and humility in our hearts. God, knowing that you did something that we could never do. We never could have rescued ourselves from our own sin. Jesus, we look within right now. We notice that there was nothing good in us. God, we look back at what you did and how you sent Jesus to the cross to do what we could never do, to be who we could never be, to save us from ourselves. And God, he was killed on our behalf and he was raised from the dead and he conquered sin and he conquered death so that we may have life. God, this morning we look ahead to the second coming of your son with the promise sealed in stone. And we give you honor and we give you praise this morning. Passover was required if you did not have the blood on the doorpost of the house and it meant that judgment was coming I just want to ask you the most important question of all do you have the blood of Jesus painted on the doorpost of your heart the Bible tells us that all of us are sinners all of us fall short of God's standard all of us come in the same way and that the same problem must be dealt with and you can try everything that you can you can try to be a good person you can try to give enough away you can try other religions you can try whatever you want but at the end of the day nothing is sufficient there was only one sacrifice that was the one sacrifice to end all sacrifices and that was Jesus when he gave his life willingly on the cross for you when he died and then he rose from the dead he now gives you the opportunity to receive him as your Lord and as your Savior. What this means is that he will now wipe away all of your sins in the past. He will now wipe away all of your sins in the future. And he will allow you the hope and the promise of eternal life. Knowing that whenever he comes back one day, you will be in that record. You will be an invited guest in the marriage supper of the Lamb. I want to invite you to give your life to Jesus if you never have. In fact, at this time, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes all across this room. If you're watching me online, I want to invite you to do the very same thing wherever it is that you're hearing these words. I want to lead you through a simple prayer of faith to give your life to Jesus. Just pray these words, dear God, I want to know you. I want you to come and live inside of me. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins, that you rose from the dead. And right now I receive your forgiveness of sins. Forgive me and make me clean. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to look up here in this room and online. I want to I tell you, if you just prayed that prayer of faith with me, we want to have a chance to know it. We want to celebrate with you. I'm going to ask you to come forward here in the room in just a moment. If you're online, you can text the word next to the number that is there on the screens, and we want to follow up with you. Like we had many times last week, we had people that responded next, saying they wanted to give their lives over to Jesus. It was such a great opportunity for us to connect with you. Maybe some of you want to join United City Church. Today can be a perfect opportunity for you to do that, to make this your church home through the process of membership. Would you come forward today? Would you lead the way? By your coming, you're going to help inspire others to do the same. Maybe you want to do what these three did today by being baptized. Maybe you need to get your baptism on the right side of your salvation. You had a religious experience whenever you were younger, but you had no idea what it is that you were doing, and it had no real meaning to you. But instead, you realize that you've now given your life to Jesus, and you want to go public in the testimony of baptism. I want to invite you as well to come forward and we can schedule your baptism. Perhaps you need prayer. If you need to be prayed for today, if you've got a need, let us pray for you. I don't want you to feel embarrassed or ashamed, but we would love to have the opportunity to be able to pray over that need today. Father, I pray you'd move in these few moments that we have left together. 
In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Would you stand up? And as you stand, you come forward right now. Our team is here waiting for you. Come on. Praise God for these already here. God for that. Who else? Who else? How is God leading you to respond today? You come on, don't wait. God's leading you to be a part of this church. You come, come on. Come on this way. Come on, let's go. This couple, praise God for you. Young couple, come and praise God. Who else? Come on. just never gets old. Hey, church family, I hope that you had the opportunity to join with us and to be able to take the Lord's Supper together as we did in just a moment. It is so important for us to recognize we all come to the Lord's table in the very same way. It's also important for us to recognize and remember when we do this, just exactly what took place, realizing that we are literally fulfilling the Passover and the fact that Jesus has completely done that. And then also the very thought that we get to look forward to the greatest feast of all. I hope that you've been encouraged today and that you've had a chance to reflect on all that God has done for you. Church, we always want you to be informed and kept up to date on all that is taking place, like our Easter services that are coming up in just a few weeks. That whole weekend is gonna look like this, six o'clock starting off on Friday night, a Good Friday baptism and Lord's Supper service. I hope that you'll make plans to be with us that night. And then Sunday morning, eight, 9 30 and 11. if you can be here in person we would love to see you it will be a safe environment for everybody that's involved but it also we're going to stream all of those services so you can invite someone and come to be a part of easter services that weekend uh, always follow us on all of our social media channels at at untd city church we would love to be able to keep you up to date on all that is taking place across all of our ministries we are excited and thankful that you've joined us today we look forward to seeing you back next week.